I've had to rewire my brain. I've literally trained my brain to work. Just like you train ChatGPT to do a specific prompt. It comes with its pros and cons. Like the, the pro is that all I do is work. It gets me to the end goal of reaching success in a, a short period of time. When in reality, it's not that short. I started when I was 16, so it's been eight years. So uh, 10 years to reach mastery in an industry. And so I'm two years away from that. I'm super excited to introduce you guys to Luke Lentz. So Luke, welcome to the stage, my friend. How are you? Hey, I'm doing fantastic, Trevor. Thanks for having me here. I, I hope to live up to that wonderful intro. <laughs> Man, <laughs> listen, you're doing big things out there. So I'm excited to learn from you. Okay. So Luke, um, the first thing I wanted to dive into is that you've partnered with more A-list celebrities on Instagram than just about any other company over the last three years. So can you talk to us and maybe shed some light on how influencer and celebrity marketing can be a game changer for brands? And what is it like, like how does somebody get a partnership in this space? How do they start to, to get some of these A-list celebrities and influencers to collaborate with them? Uh, talk to me about that. Over the past three years, we partnered up with some celebrities like Kevin Hart, Snoop Dogg, Bella Thorne, Nicki Minaj, Cardi B. And I, I think that statistic is right in terms of the comp our, our company partnering up with more A-list celebrities than any other company in the space So over the past three years. But we're talking about two separate things here with celebrity marketing and influencer marketing. We kind of separate those like celebrities being like A-list celebrities, ones at like literally the top of the food chain in the celebrity realm of things. And so I'm going to start with influencers and then we'll get up to celebrities. But in terms of influencer marketing, it's one of the, it's one of the best marketing methods for any single business out there, because you're attaching your brand name to somebody who already has an established following and an established audience. And ideally you're working with an influencer that has that established following in a specific demographic that matches yours. And so you're basically stealing all of their hours and all of their dedication that they've used to create that audience and funneling it over to your product because they don't know how to create a business behind them themselves. And so how we started our first business is we started our first business as a product-based business. That's how Hikey started when I was 16 in high school. And we started fully only on influencer marketing. And we didn't have budgets to spend outlandish amounts on big influencers or celebrities. And so we had to work with micro-influencers. And we categorize micro-influencers usually at anywhere from the 50 to 200,000 follower range, depending upon if you're looking at their Instagram or TikTok. And we would pick out specific influencers in our niche that match the exact audience that we're going after. And it's super easy to find those just based off of hashtags and off of location searches on Instagram and TikTok. And when you find them, these micro influencers, there's tons of them. And so they don't get that many deals. And so usually if you're giving away something for free to them, like if you have a legitimate good product, you can usually give away that product for free to them in exchange for them to do some sort of deliverables, like a post, a story, which is astronomical in terms of not having to pay, especially when you're starting up. So I suggest for any single, especially product-based business to start with micro influencers in their specific niche, because they can usually get it for free and then work their way up. So can and you, you're working, can you classify that again, as far as the following size, what do you classify as a micro influencer? Right. And then, and then, yeah. okay. So you got micro influencer and then you got influencer. So what's the, what's the following size that would put somebody in the micro category? Yeah, micro category is usually anywhere from like 50,000 to 200,000 followers. Got you. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'm a micro then, y'all. Check it out. I'm a micro, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to get up there, but you know what I'm saying right now? I'm like, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm a micro. So somebody who's got a, a product-based business, let's say they, they got some, uh, you know, T-shirts or some kind of whatever, whatever it is, uh, it would benefit them to reach out to me and say, yo, we want you to start wearing our swag or something like that. Give 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 me something, okay? Make me feel good because I'm just a little guy out here trying to make it. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then they're going to be like, okay, cool. You're going to wear my swag, okay? And then I'm going to put it on, take some pictures, and, uh, and then put it on my social media, right? And, and tag their company page or something like that, right? So 
Uh, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Clothing brands are very difficult, just in general. Clothing brands are probably one of the hardest businesses to start up because it's like creating culture. And every single person wants to create a, a clothing brand because it's so influential, the most powerful clothing brands out there. But it's so difficult because it's the barrier to entry to enter a clothing brand is so, so low because anybody can go on a, a print on demand store, put a, put a sleek logo on, and then start up a quick Shopify store with that. So barrier to entry is extremely low. So there's tons of people out there doing that. Um, but in terms of influencer marketing, I went into micro influencers, then there's macro influencers. So you can level up to macro influencers, like above 200,000 followers, when you start getting budgets to be able to reinvest. This is massive because people start recognizing macro influencers, especially in the niche. And this is where crazy stuff starts to happen with macro influencers is because especially if you have a product-based business, you can pay macro influencers and you don't have to pay a ton. You can work with just a couple to be basically your major brand ambassadors of your product or even service. And then you're getting them to create content for you and you're paying them a one-time fee and repurposing that content on direct ads like Facebook ads and TikTok ads. And you're basically utilizing that one-time fee content mm. that you paid them for and re repurposing it forever on uh, retargeting okay, ads. And, okay, that's... and everybody in your industry knows who they are because mm. they're a macro influencer in your industry and that's how it's so powerful so smart so smart so you'd get like you know and I, this wouldn't be considered a macro but i'm just as an example you would get somebody like uh like joe rogan right he's gonna be like an a-list right you would consider him like he, an a-list so he, he's an a-list yeah he's an a-list Joe Rogan's an a -list. right yeah but somebody right let's just let's just say you got a macro right you get somebody you you get them to do you pay them one time for a sponsored post or something like that, a video, a clip, whatever. And then what you're saying is after you have that now, th that's your asset that you can run ads against. Boom, boom, boom. So it's not just it's not just their initial post and their audience that sees it, but now you can run those ads and retarget and all that kind of stuff, right? Exactly. Repurpose it forever. You can put it on your website if you have the contract with them. Like an example of a macro influencer who's not an A-list celebrity would be like Bradley Barron for the for the fitness space. Huge influencer, big, big social media. You're you're probably gonna be looking to pay like anywhere from 10 to like 30 grand for a post from him. But that video, if you write up the contract correctly, you can repurpose that piece of content forever. That's amazing. Yeah. And use it for your website, which builds credibility and authority and this, 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 and that. Right. So yeah, 30 grand well spent, I would say, you know, in that space. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about a list. Okay. What, what are we talking about with the, with the, the people like Joe Rogan and things like that. And then the Kevin Hart's, you know, you get, you get them to do something for you. You're really doing something right. Yeah. So A-list celebrities are interesting because our company took off when we started working with A-list celebrities, but it's very hard to have a business model where you can justify the expense of working with an A-list celebrity. So we were able to find a business model, well, really create a business model of thin air. We had clients that we were working on their social media profiles with, and this was right at the peak of Instagram's engagement where Instagram engagement started going down. And so every single day we were being contacted by our Instagram clients saying, we need more followers. We need more engagement when engagement rates are going down. So you have like demand and supply, you know, the, the supply of engagement is going down and the demand is ever increasing. And so we found a way to partner up with A-list celebrities to do a massive giveaway. And then with that giveaway, they would be directing traffic over to our clients, the celebrities. And so we would host these massive campaigns and then we would get our clients to pay part of the ca total campaign cost. And then we would make money from it and be able to host this huge campaign. And so what was in it for the celebrities? Was it just because they got to be seen as like goodwill or giving away something like Oprah giving away cars or what's up? Like what, what was in it for yeah. them? <laughs> The celebrity got the best deal of them all. They got to give away something massive. And then plus we paid them a huge upfront fee. Like we're talking six figure fees minimum for 
all of these all of these celebrities. But the thing with the A-list celebrities is the majority of the majority of companies can't justify the expense of it because working with a macro influencer would be better than working with an A-list celebrity because you're spending so much more just for the name of the person. And it's where the the payment for their engagement rates on their social media platform don't really make any sense anymore. Like if you compare the cost of a macro influencer with the cost of a celebrity and you compare their social media engagement rates and following, it's it's completely disproportionate in terms of what you're paying. And so you're paying so much for the name. And so usually people who partner up, I suggest companies that really want to partner with A-list celebrities, split it between multiple brands somehow and finding a way to do that. And so we found a way to do that where we split the cost of an A-list celebrity with multiple brands. That's awesome. Okay. So I like that. Um, my question is on this, when it comes to the, the A-list celebrities, uh, also, would it be better if you're a brand or, or a business, an entrepreneur, right, to do the who you know thing, meaning like network, you know, try to get in front of these people, try to build a relationship, try to get it more organically, right, to get something out of it. Do you, have Has that worked for you? Have you used any of that kind of strategies to try to like, you know, you know, rub elbows with Kevin Hart instead of like, you know, pay, paying him a big, big chunk. I mean, if he was if he was friends or friend of a friend and, you know, he's kind of doing you a favor who, you know, type of a deal networking. You ever, have any experience with that? So that can work with micro and macro influencers. But mm. with A-list celebrities, they know the worth of mm. Their name and their social media following, and they're just not going to. They're like, have, "Sorry, bro." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they're yeah, like, like, "Not going to do it." Set up deals. We've set up deals. For example, like Kevin Hart was actually set up through his really close friend, and so we got an extremely good deal. But it was still a six-figure price tag, and so they're not going to do it. They're not going to do work for for nothing. They know the they know the value of their name. They know the value of their social media audience. They know the value. Well, of that makes sense that too, do. because I would think that if they started doing it, you know, even if you're friends or whatever, and they started doing little things here and there, um, you know, you got to say no, right? You got to be able to say no so, somewhere because otherwise, it's you know, everybody's going to be reaching out, you know, and then they probably have all these gatekeepers too who are keeping all of that away from them, anyways, right? Like they're not typically the ones making those calls anyways, right? So, you know, you got to go through the gatekeepers, right? The gatekeepers are a major, major problem in the celebrity industry because you actually don't know if you're talking with the right person. And we've been scammed tens of thousands of dollars by talking with the wrong people associated because there's some celebrities out there who you can't get in direct contact with and they don't have management, like especially like some rappers out there. And so, you, you end up talking with like their security guard that says that they can get the deal done. And then it just goes nowhere. You tie up a contract and just goes absolutely nowhere. We've, we've had that happen a couple of times. Which is horrible. Yeah. You just cut your losses on that one. I mean, shoot, yeah. you know, Hey, listen, that's an interesting subject. I've been scammed before, you know, uh, I, I'm serious. I've been scammed before, you know, you guys gotta be careful with these scams. They're out there, man. I've been scammed. Uh, there was this, it was like a fake social media show, man. Like I was supposed to go on this big show, man. And, and they, they, they blew it up. And, and the thing that was interesting about it was, um, uh, it was supposed to be like a, a reality TV show, not a social media show, a reality TV show. Anyways, it, it was like, um, all, a bunch of people I knew were involved in it. Right. And they made it seem really real. Like this was almost like fire festival. Do you remember, uh, hearing about fire festival? Where that guy tried to, yeah, he tried to create like that, that, um, like concert or whatever and screwed a bunch of people. That's what this was. I feel like this guy was trying to create a reality TV show, right? He, he was legitimately trying, but was way over his head and was just taking in money. It was like over promising, under delivering, and then essentially just doing a conference and kind of recording a conference and calling it a reality TV show. And uh, anyways, he was screwing people. It was called the social movement. If anybody ever uh, has heard about that, he screwed a lot of people. And I got screwed. I got screwed, man, because there was supposed to be some monetary uh, uh, back end uh, in the contract where uh, it was kind of like one of these deals where like like a shark tank where you, that you were creating a business. And uh, if you're business got voted on, right? If the judges voted on your business, 
then they would actually go build it. And if they built it, there was back end uh, money built in the contract. And so that that's how he spun it to where the people who were on this show had to pay to be on the show. So I got screwed out of fifteen thousand dollars, right? And uh, and and not just me. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Like he scammed millions and millions and millions of dollars, and he's done it. Uh, here's the thing: no one's hold this guy accountable. No one's like gone after him or whatever. I think they were trying to get a class action lawsuit at one point, but um, he's done it like three times. Um, and, uh, it's crazy. This is called the social movement, but guys, all I'm saying is you gotta be careful for scammers out there. There's lots of scams. I've been scammed, you know, uh, and you just gotta be careful. Do your due diligence when you're, you know, you're dealing with people. But, um, yeah, it was interesting. Cause I, I knew a lot of the people that were like, like I'm friends with some people, some other people that got screwed. And so I don't know, I saw, I saw them, uh, join in and I'm like, shoot, it must be real, you know? And uh, anyways, that's how I got to Yeah, it is tough, man. Tough. You, 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 you just got to write that off as a business expense, like yep. at the end of the day and move on from it. But it's that's so it. hard. We, we made a rule in our, our company that we won't pay a single vendor or person that doesn't have a brand anymore. Because mm. we've always been scammed by people who don't have brands mm. because then they have nothing to lose. Because if they don't have a brand, they have nothing to lose. You know, mm. you can't tarnish their name. Right. Anything. Like we would just we would just post bad press about somebody if they screwed us and had a bad brand because we do press. So it would well, be so easy. Well, yeah. And, and Instagram, you got to be careful. You know, there's lots of people hitting you up in your DMs talking about this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. You got to be careful with Instagram, too. You know, there's a lot of scammers out there, too. So, um, yeah, just, guys, beware. Do your due diligence, right? You want to go with a credible company. Uh, get reviews, right? Get talk. See if you can talk to some clients, stuff like that. See, see if these people are legit before you just start uh, giving them your money. Um, okay, so I got another question for you. You know, social media is always evolving. OK, and that's one of the biggest challenges, right? It's constantly evolving. There's like new platforms popping up every time you turn around. I'm like, like we're on Clubhouse right now, which was hot in 2020. Right. It's kind of like fizzled out a little bit. But, you know, they're, they're always popping up a new platform. There's Clapper. Right. And that never did nothing for me. I'm on the Clapper. You know, there's like all these platforms popping up. OK. Can you talk to us about maybe some of the platforms that businesses should be really focusing on in 2024 and maybe what are some strategies that you recommend uh, for people that are going to use them? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Great question. And it's hard. It's very difficult. Somebody coming into the atmosphere of social media and not having a presence established right now and having no idea which platform to choose. It's a, it's a massive struggle and then not having any team and building a team from scratch. Like content is hard in and of itself to create. And then all of the backend work of scripting it out, editing, the actual posting, the engagement on the platform. It's multiple full-time jobs to actually do it properly across the social media platforms. But the exact platform is really dependent on the type of business being run. Now, there's some platforms that make sense for every single business to be on, like Instagram. I see Instagram as the digital business card. So it's either your personal digital business card or the business digital business card. And so on Instagram, like main priority for your personal brand and business to be on there. And our main thing is just making our clients Instagram pages, like you said, with LinkedIn, making it like a landing page where when people go onto it, they can see what you're about, what you do, and that you're trustworthy in a, a matter of two seconds of looking at your profile. They can see your, your the bio and know exactly what you do. And they can see videos that build trust and showcase who you are. And so what we do is we usually pin, because you're able to pin Instagram videos and reels on your Instagram page now. So we actually create curated content for our clients that we manage their Instagram profiles to make sure that those are the three videos that people, when they visit their profile, are most likely to view. So for businesses, we put like case studies and stuff like that to basically re reassure people. For personal brands, we put their life story on their first three posts so people can get to know them if they're trying to dig deeper. And then if we go into other social media platforms, TikTok is an interesting one. TikTok had its huge run-up mm -hmm. of 
engagement. I missed it. I missed it, man. Dude, I missed it. Hold up. Hold up. So back in like uh, 2019, okay, do you know Evan Carmichael? He's big on YouTube. Evan Carmichael, right? So uh, at Video Marketing World here in Dallas, I, I got to meet him. He was on stage and stuff like that. And and he was talking about TikTok and, and uh, you know, get, that's when Gary Vee was like, got to get on the TikTok, you know, got to get on the TikTok. Man, I totally missed that whole boat, man. And my TikTok doesn't do squat, bro. Like maybe because I, I also... I, I'm sure it probably has its own algorithm too, like your own personal algorithm. So when I first started posting content, I was actually just posting this um, LinkedIn content that worked, that performed well on LinkedIn. It was square and it was, uh, you know, had the banners on the top and the bottom. It was square. It was, it was, it was really for LinkedIn. And all of a sudden I was posting it on TikTok. Didn't do nothing, obviously, because it wasn't optimized for, uh, you know, for, for TikTok. Right. And so I think I just, puked on my own algorithm over there when I first started like and now that I am um making the content specifically for TikTok it still doesn't do anything it's like it never I don't know maybe you can help me with that I don't know what are your thoughts yeah there's a few things that you and the audience can particularly look at with TikTok and there's a few things with TikTok one is that people crave authenticity on TikTok more than anything so actual like raw content usually content that's like created on the platform or could be created on tiktok or on CapCut, and so like one of those types of videos because they're able to resonate with it the other thing is tiktok is so fast paced in terms of how people scroll through the main feed and the majority of the user base even the older demographic are so unfocused and so on tiktok you, you have the least amount of attention span where you have the least amount of time to hook the viewer in. And so 100% of our strategies on TikTok, and this goes to other social media platforms, like majority of it is on the hook of the videos. And so we actually, for our clients, we create an entire video where it's a very good piece of value, addressing a problem, giving value, and then giving a call to action. And then we'll film five different hooks for that one video and post it across a month and a half because so many people just aren't viewing it just because they're not getting past the first two seconds of the video. And so you can just recreate that and then get more chances of it, of it doing. So I want you well. to say, a good piece of content. I want you to say that formula again, because it's something that I know. And it, it's, um, but to me, this is one of the things like to me, because I'm, I'm in the space and I'm a content creator. Like I know what you just said, but I think somebody who's starting from square one I remember when I first heard it, actually, it was like this light bulb, like, bing. what you just said was the problem, right? Uh, value or solution, and then call to action, right? That was kind of like the formula. And then, and then a hook, the hook is like slapping them with the problem right up front or something that's going to draw them in, you know, putting that problem up front. You don't want to put the problem in the middle or in the back, but you want to put the problem up front some solutions, some value, some some golden nuggets, some takeaways, some something that's going to make their life better or easier, um, you know, if they apply and take action, and then a call to action at the very end. So can you talk to me about that, that strategy? Because um, I remember when I first heard it, it was a big light bulb for me. 100%. Yeah. So just breaking it down part by part is overarching, broad overview is whenever we're working with a social media client, you only want to create social media content specifically around what you're best at, what you're most educated at. You only want to be speaking around topics that you wholeheartedly know extremely well. And then going into it in terms of the micro content that you're actually creating is in the hook, the stuff that you're creating in the hook is most of the time we can create hooks off of ChatGPT. Usually we get them, we give ChatGPT the full video script, and then we say create a create a hundred different hook variations, and then we look through it and just see which ones are the best ones. ChatGPT is actually best at <laughs> creating the the hooks rather than the full scripts because the full scripts it's not as good at creating because it's a bit inauthentic right now. Mm, yeah, it do, it does. Yeah, I've, I, you know ChatGPT is great for a lot of things, uh, but you're right as far as like some of the video scripts and stuff like that, um, they do kind of they kind of like a little cheesy, right? 
So, uh, but I love what you just said, though. So, guys, if you're listening online, so, you, okay, you give ChatGPT the uh, description, right? Like, or the transcription, I'm sorry. So, the the um, the the video that you just created, you you transcribe it and give it the transcription and you tell it, give me a hundred hooks for, for this specific uh, video. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. You want to go in depth with it. So you want to first create the script of what you're going to create, which is a problem. And then, so you're addressing a problem, you're giving a solution, which is like some sort of value. And then ideally you want to tie a personal story in there so that it's custom to you. And then, so you have that script and then ideally you have a ton of different scripts and then you want to basically teach chat GPT because like, you don't want to just put that script in there and then do a hundred hooks. You want to be like chat GPT, you are a social media expert that is trained at all of the highest level social media algorithms and attention engineer. And what you want to do is we want to create hooks for these specific videos that hook the, the viewer in or not cheesy in a tonality that is slightly comedic. And then, so you're, you're really like just showcasing every single thing to chat GBT, which is really what it is. Chat GBT is the highest level of communication. Like it's as if you're talking with somebody who's the smartest person in the world, but has nothing, knows nothing about what the context of the situation. I, I love it. I mean, I'm going to give you another mic drop for that. Okay. Because here's the deal. Um, I love what you said when you're using chat GPT, you got to kind of give it the hat that it's wearing. Like you got to tell it who it is. OK, like like he said, Luke said, hey, you're the best social media, you know, content writer or whatever in the world. Like tell it who it is. You know, if if uh, let's say you're writing content for doctors. OK, like you're the best social media expert that specializes in doctors or something like that. Like be very, very specific because the more specific you are with the prompt, uh, and you tell chat, chat B, GPT who it is, like what, what hat does it need to be wearing in this moment? Uh, let's say you're writing a book, you know, tell chat GPT, you know, you're the best, you know, author in the, on the planet or something like that. Right. You got to tell it who it is so that chat GPT un understands what, you know, what to do. Right. Yeah. I love totally. that. Giving it full context. Yeah. Give it full context. I love that. I love that. Okay. So um, I want to move on a little bit from this. Um, let's talk about scaling a company to eight figures, man. Impressive, bro. By the way, let me ask you a question. How how old are you? I'm 24. 24. God, God. Hold up. Shut the show down. Man, you talking 24. Guys, come on, man. Come on, son. Y'all need to go connect with this, this guy right here, Luke Lentz. He's the man in the whole 50 grand, the whole eight figures, okay? Need to go connect with him. Um, that's amazing, man. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Do you just sometimes like pinch yourself? Like, are you are you soaking it all in or what? Like, talk to me, man. Come on. 24, dude. You like, come on, man. I don't think I am soaking it all in. You know, I, I think that um I'm not sure if this is for every single person that reaches a decent amount of success, but for me specifically, I've had to rewire my brain. And what I mean by that is like, I don't mean that in some like cliche way. I mean that in like, I've literally trained my brain to work. I just like you train chat GPT to do a specific prompt. I've, I've trained my brain and myself to work. And so it comes with its pros and cons. Like the, the pro is that all I do is work. And so like, that's not really a pro, but like it, it gets me to the end goal of reaching success in a, a short period of time when in reality, it's not that short. I started when I was 16. So it's been eight years. So uh, 10 years to reach mastery in industry. And so I'm two years away from that, but it, it, it's, um, yeah, it, I have a very hard time being present in certain places. I have a hard time like uh, slowing down and just enjoying like little things in life when I used to enjoy little things in life. And so there's, there's a lot of pros and cons to it. There is man. I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I have a hard time slowing down too. I'm, I understand that feeling. Right. And it's something you're constantly thinking about all the time and stuff like that. Like I literally dream 
about business, which is crazy. Like I'll have dreams about certain things. Some of, some of the times it's where my best ideas come from. Some of the greatest solutions to problems and all that kind of stuff come from my dreams. Um, but yeah, man. So, wow. But I bet, I don't know about for you, but for me, that work ethic and that, that sweat equity and just, you know, grinding it out, you know, uh, kept me out of a lot of trouble. Cause I got in a lot of trouble when I was a teenager, I was running crazy. And then work was really what saved my life, to be honest with you. I mean, amongst a, a lot of other things, but a positive obsession, like you're talking about. So, I mean, you're obsessed with this. Like it sounds like you're obsessed, but it's like a positive obsession. I mean, right. So it's not, it's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. It's, it's probably keeping you out of trouble and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, for sure. Definitely a positive obsession, but for sure obsession. Like uh, to give you an example, like I'm 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 in Dubai right now, and today I I've been working for the past uh, twelve hours, and like I I I haven't I haven't left. Man, you're like I got Dubai in my out my window, okay, and I'm in this room grinding it out. You know what I'm saying, guys? This is why he's successful, though. Okay, he's why he's successful. Okay, it's the sacrifices that you make. And you're setting up your legacy, man. You're setting up your, you know, your position. You're only 24, dude. You got so much, so much, man. I just see massive things for you, and you're already doing massive things. What advice would you give to young entrepreneurs looking to take massive risks and and to to build their empires from scratch? What what kind of advice would you give to that person? I I love that question about massive risk because I always talk about how especially when you're young, like if you're in high school, university, that's the time where you need to be taking the biggest risks. You don't have a family to feed. You don't really have a house to that you have to put over your head. Like you might be living with your parents. You have so much freedom and so little responsibility where like that, that goes inversely proportional as you get older because the responsibility keeps increasing. When you get a family, your responsibility keeps increasing, and so your your risk ratio has to go down proportionally to that. I, I feel like I'm I'm lucky because I didn't have really anybody that told me that, but I was always always of the mindset that I would go big or go home. And I think what got me into that actually was in high school before I started up the business. I was big into gambling, like really big into gambling. Yeah, yeah, really bad, really bad. I because I would work my ass off. I did painting painting jobs. I did demolition work when I was in grade 10 and I would use all of that money for my summer and just gamble it throughout the year and pretty much lost it all. But it got me in the mindset where like thousands of dollars really isn't that much money to lose. And I think that that increased my risk tolerance a ton for sure. So I I think what other people need to do to, I don't think that every single person in this world can, can take risks and digest risks. And that's like the main determining factor between an entrepreneur and a non-entrepreneur and somebody who works within a company is their appetite for risk. And so like entrepreneurs inherently have an extremely high appetite for risk, but you can still be an extremely high performer, just not have the same appetite for risk and then be a high performer inside of a business. Like for example, I have extremely high performers inside of our, our business that just don't have the same appetite for risk. They have unbelievable work ethic. They are unbelievable conscientious and they are smarter than me, 100%. They just don't have the same appetite for risk and they are able to get a consistent pay, which I, I respect. And so for the, for the people who are able to digest risk and think that they can take on risk, like they just have to dive in. They just have to start. Like they shouldn't be listening to a, a podcast like this. Like they should stop the podcast and get to work. <laughs> ah, let's go. Hold up, Mike Drum. Let's go. <laughs> Listen, uh, I love this conversation, actually, because I'm in financial services. And so, you know, when we do people's investments in retirement, stuff like that, right, uh, they got to take a risk tolerance questionnaire, right? And so they take this little questionnaire and it tells us a little bit about, you know, uh, how risky they can be based off of their answers and based off of their score. And um, a big factor in that is age, right? Because you, you have so much time to weather a storm, right? And so listen, I almost feel like they should do that. Think about that. Like we're, we have these kids getting out of high school when their risk tolerance is at the highest, right? They can, they can take on the most risk and we're just putting them in this thing called college 
and just sending them off and they don't even know what they want to do. They're confused. They go into debt, right? I would much rather say, see somebody, let's say they're going to take out a hundred thousand dollar loan to go to a university. Well, let's take that hundred thousand dollars and let's, let's start a business. Let's get a hundred thousand dollar business loan, right? Which is going to be a lot harder, which it shouldn't be harder. Like, think about that. Imagine that they'll give a hundred thousand dollars to college. Like like it's going out of style. Like, Hey, here's a hundred thousand dollars. But to get a hundred thousand dollar business loan, it's a lot harder. Right. But if I'm an 18 year old kid graduating, I got a high risk tolerance and I have a dream, something that I want to go do. Like, man, I'd much rather get that hundred thousand dollars and put it in myself. I'm betting on me. You know what I'm saying? Man, I think you'd be further ahead, further a lot further ahead if you did that. Just saying. Just that's a great TikTok right there. You like that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great TikTok. St- student loans are meant to trap people into the system. Yeah, I know. Like, of it's course. the only type of loan that is the easiest to obtain that you can attain before the tw- twenty-one years of age, that you can attain without credit, and that you can attain that lasts bankruptcy. You can go bankrupt and your student loans will last with you. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. You know, uh, I'm all for, you know, I, now I, listen, I don't want to just sit here and say that college is bad and da, 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 da. No, I don't want to sit there and say that it's, it's for some, it is for some, and there's specialized fields where you're going to need that degree. Okay. Specialized fields. We're going to need that degree, but most people, when you get out of high school, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know what you what's going to make you happy until you try some things. So get out there. You hear Gary Vee talks about this all the time. Get out there and just try a bunch of stuff, man. See what you like. See what you love. You know, what, what gets you fired up, man? You really don't know. You're 18. You're just a baby, okay? I remember when I was 18, I was an idiot, okay? I'm still an idiot, but I was a real big idiot when I was 18. Come on now. I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? And, and um. So anyways, yeah, if I, I I can only imagine, I'm grateful actually that, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, do that. I went to community college for like a semester, bro. <laughs> and I was like, I was there for like a semester and I'm like, man, this is like high school over again. I need to go make some money. You know what I'm saying? I got into sales. So uh, anyways. Hey, I'm, that semester was worth it then. Yeah. That semester taught, taught you what you needed. <laughs> Ah, uh, there you go. That's a great way to think about it, right? That co- that semester mm-hmm. of college, uh, Quad C, uh, Collin County Community College, represent Quad C, and uh, yep, went there for like a semester. And I remember they were making me take a bunch of like classes that didn't even count for credit, right? Because I was behind, right? Like they made you take these tests. I was like behind in math and behind in all these things because I barely graduated high school. I hated I hated high school. So I went there for one semester in college and was like, man, I got to get out of here and make some money. This is ridiculous. Anyways. All right. So we digress. But um, let's talk a little bit about um, some pitfalls and mistakes. OK, because you're 24 and you've built this empire. But I'm sure right? you've been doing it for eight years. I'm sure there's some things that like if you could go back and talk to your 16 year old self, that's when you started. Right. Go back and talk to your 16 year old self and say, hey, man, you got to watch out. You, there's a pitfall coming. Like, Watch out for this. Um, what What are some of those and how did you um, overcome them? And then what? Yeah. What, what were some lessons that you learned through it? So many mistakes, man. Um, I'll run through a few that were the biggest ones and I'll try and give some context around it. First biggest mistake was with our product-based business. We were very successful selling our first product, which was wireless earbuds. And we were extremely successful because we just had the perfect timing with the product. We were the first wireless earbuds in the USA selling them. Before AirPods, Samsung Galaxy Gear, like only AirPods on the market. Imagine that. Everybody wanted them. And so uh, it's funny because I'm not even wearing them right now because... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's been so long, but we, we we ran that up to a seven figure business, and we thought we thought that we could release any product into the marketplace, and they would sell just like the wireless earbuds because we just didn't know what we didn't know. I was in high school at the time, like with seven figures on my Shopify account. I just had like such a high ego, and so 
we spent so much time developing a charging backpack because it was the next thing that we wanted, which was a, a backpack that we would wear that has a charging feature in it to charge our phone because that was a, a huge thing. And it's what we wanted. And so spent eight months designing this and took out a loan because we didn't have enough cash flow because we had so much invested into the wireless earbuds, took out a loan to pay for these uh, backpacks and they didn't sell. Horrible. Like, so the, the, the main thing is it, it evolved into a bunch of different problems. It was it turned into like a $350,000 mistake. But the main thing was like that we got greedy. So we, we overpurchased, took out a loan when things were going well, which I think you should never do. If things are going well, do not take out a loan. Like just keep bootstrapping it. We got greedy, um, which is one of the seven deadly sins. You never want to do that. And then we, um, we, purchased a product that we didn't first test out in the marketplace, which is like a cardinal sin. You always want to do a test before doing a bulk purchase of something. That was one error. Another error was uh, getting uh, partnering up with some of the wrong people. And what I mean by that is like, when you're going into business with somebody and partnering up, it's like a, it's like a marriage, you know, like you're, you're fully committing to them, especially if you're dedicating all of your time into the business. It, it's actually, it, it's actually more than a marriage because you're spending all of your time on it. And so we definitely had some problems where we didn't vet people thoroughly enough. And what it came back to is that I'm partnered with my brothers now and I have ultimate trust with them. And so my main thing with having a good business partner is trust, full, complete trust with the person. And then the third really big mistake is uh, once we started obtaining a lot of money, then we kind of didn't know what to do with it. Like there was this one time where we ran, it was actually the Kevin Hart campaign and we made $600,000 in profit in three weeks. And so an additional $600,000 of profit hit our bank account and we're over a million dollars in our bank account and I'm 20 years old. And, you know, I, I didn't have any mentors at the time. And so I, I bought a Lamborghini Urus. <laughs> Dude, my <laughs> Bro, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just gotta say, hold up. First of all, another mic drop. Okay, let let's talk about this for just a second. Um, on one side, like you know, you're gonna hear all the gurus like like Grant Cardone tell you that you're like an idiot for doing that. Okay, like you're gonna hear him say that. <clears throat> He's like, you shouldn't buy that stuff until you have enough uh passive income to pay for it right like you should buy assets that that pay you passive income right like that's what he talks about uh but but on the other side i go man yolo <laughs> like i'm like you're 20 years old bro you got you a lambo you're gonna look back you know what i'm saying like i don't know i, I just dude and, That's no, freaking dude, awesome. I think what a great too. story. What a great story. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I think about that too. And honestly, for like anybody listening, like no matter no matter how good you're at right now or no matter how bad things are, it all contributes to the story. Like no matter how bad a mistake that you have, it all contributes to the story. You know, it's the things that you're going to tell your kids about, your grandkids about, like why, might as well make it out as outlandish as possible. Like I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a lot of pleasure telling my kids and grandkids I made the stupidest decision when I was 20. <laughs> and bought this Lambo rolling around. Dude, you still got it? No, I sold it. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Did you take a hit on it? Yeah, I wish I still had it. I wish I still had it. It was beautiful. Yeah. What color was it? Yeah. It was all black, got a matte black, and then we put gold rims on it and like a gold tip exhaust. So it was like fully black and gold. It was nuts. Bro, you were rolling around like Batman. Okay. That's what you were. You were rolling around like freaking Batman in the all blacked out Lambo. Dude, that's but it sick. was a huge mistake, man. It was a huge mistake. We I didn't have any I didn't have anybody to tell me that it was a stupid purchasing decision. Nobody told then. you that? Come on. Somebody had what? to say, like, come on, Luke, what are you doing? Your parents, who well, my, my, my accountant, my accountant is kind of like my, my good buddy. Yeah. And so when I told him that I was going to do it, he kind of gave me the same reaction that you gave. And he's like, like, th Luke, this isn't a good decision. But honestly, <laughs> why not? <laughs> you know, I mean, listen, 
I'm just saying, uh, sometimes, you know, I mean, you could have done something different. Let's talk about that. Like somebody should have talked to you and said, Hey, Luke, okay. I know you got this itch. Okay. And I know that's a cool toy, right? But there's other cool toys too. Can we scratch that itch? How much was the Lambo? Just curious. It was 310,000 Canadian. Okay. 310. So can we scratch that itch for like 50? You know, can, can, yeah. can we scratch that itch with with a little less money? Like, how, how can we scratch that itch? You know what I'm saying? Because that's what it was. That would have been a smart. Yeah, that would have been a smart question to ask. Yeah, it, yeah. it was the itch. Can we buy ego. a boat? The, you know, like a like a like, yeah. a, you know, a $50,000 boat or, you know, can we do it? Can we do it for, for a little bit less? OK, and then take that money and reinvest. Like, how can we, you know, anyway, just a conversation. So no one really talked to you. They were just like. Bro, go for it. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't really talk to. I didn't really talk to anybody. But since then, like we've we've been better. Like we bought we bought in a couple of apartment buildings across Canada, like in Ontario and and uh, Winnipeg. And so, definitely, definitely things better with like our investment opportunities. Tell a lot me, in crypto. Tell me, you at least got some content, right? With some videos. So much. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's awesome man that's so cool um okay so tell me about maybe a client that you've worked with that has worked with high key enterprises and has had a transformative you know impact on their brand or your business is there any notable moments any um key success stories that you can highlight yeah tons tons um there's one person who i'm really passionate that we're working with because he's turned into our exact target client. Cause like over the years we've worked with diff tons of different clients because we didn't know the exact client that we wanted to service. So we just took on anybody who was willing to pay for our services. But over time we realized that the, the riches are in the niches. And so we we've really focused down on the exact client that we work with. And so now we only work with companies that are working towards an IPO exit or capital raise because they can get the most value of our branding services because we're increasing their enterprise value by publishing press, getting them tons of social media exposure. And so they can get more value. So there's this one client, uh, Nano Nuclear. And so uh, they're basically a small fish in a big pond of nuclear energy. and they they came to us where when they were like a, a pretty sizable company but not a big name in the industry and they were going for a massive capital raise and so we helped publish a ton of press about them and it actually changed where they got so much exposure that they turned their capital raise into an ipo and so now they're now they're getting listed on the uh, new york stock exchange next year and when that happens it's going to be a great case study some other ones is like we have um we worked with a good friend of mine who's named Robbie Clark, and we helped him with his social media and press. And he owns four hundred fifty million dollars of real estate across residential real estate across Canada. So he's the he's the biggest residential real estate holder across Canada individually. And we we just helped him grow his brand because the main thing is these there's so many massive business owners out there that don't have don't don't have any digital presence. And so we just try and get their digital presence up to a place of where they're actually doing business because it, it decreases their credibility and de decreases their brand perception when a $100 million business owner has a 1,000 followers on Instagram, no LinkedIn presence. It's like, what are you doing? Right. No, that makes so much sense. It's like, uh, okay, um, get with the program, okay, when especially if you got, if you're a big big company like that like it just says that i don't know you are neglecting this right like and how much bigger could you be if you put put a little effort into that you know what i mean so i don't know you're absolutely right it does you lose credibility right and it's unfortunate that we're a society that's like that i wish this wasn't the case i gotta be honest with you luke i gotta tell you man i wish that you know, uh, as an entrepreneur myself, I wish I didn't have to do all this social media crap. I'm going to be straight up honest with you, man. I wish I didn't have to. And there's so many channels and they just keep putting out new channels and you got to learn this, got to learn that. And they're always evolving and changing. Da, 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 da. It's like, oh my gosh, wish you didn't have to do that in today's day and age. But guess what? Wish in one hand, spit in the other and see which one fills up faster. Okay. 
So it is what it is. And y'all business owners and entrepreneurs out there that are like thinking about, should I, should I do this social media stuff? You need to do it. it you, you don't have a choice really. I mean, I don't know. That's, that's just kind of the way it is. Well, dude, you're going to get extremely happy when decentralized social media comes around and takes over the yeah? entire social media. Talk to me. Talk to me, man. Holler at your boy. Let me hear about this decentralized, okay, uh, social media. It's like crypt, crypto crypto social. <laughs> so the essence of decentralized social media is that – do you understand, like, blockchain technology at all? Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. It's, okay. it's a little confusing, but I, I understand it, yeah. Yeah. For the audience that doesn't understand like blockchain technology is it's basically like um, a, a public database that everybody can see. So like, for example, a good visual is imagine a Google spreadsheet that has open availability to anybody to edit. So like I'm looking at this spreadsheet and somebody across the world, you, you Trevor, in a completely different area is looking at that same spreadsheet. And when you put in basically a value into the spreadsheet, then it gets confirmed and then locks in and nobody can change it, but everybody can view it. That's the essence of like a blockchain where basically it's publicly viewable to everybody, everything on the, on the blockchain, but people can't edit it and taper with it. That's a great, by the way, can I tell you, Luke, that's a great um, way to describe it. Okay. Cause I've heard a lot of uh, people try to describe you know, blockchain, blockchain and, and, and crypto and NFTs and all of these different things, right? And they're trying to explain it in a way that's simple for people to understand. And that was a very good description, by the way. Uh, I might nice. steal I that. that. I might steal that, okay? <laughs> Just saying. Do it. Like, that's a very good visual for somebody to say, okay, cool. I, I kind of get where, you know, to create a visual around what it actually is. So that's good. Yeah. So... Th- Basically, that's the basis of a blockchain. And now what we have with like the centralized social media applications like Instagram, YouTube, you have the big companies that own these social media applications like Meta, Google, all these platforms. And so all of the information, all of the data, all of the content being posted, all of the followers, all of the new accounts being created, it's being stored in those public databases of these centralized social media companies. And so what decentralized social media would be is it would just be opening up all of the data that's stored in with the social media applications and actually giving ownership back to the people who are who are on the platform. So everybody would be able to see everything. And so what that means is a lot of different things. It means that when you create an account on a so- decentralized social media blockchain, nobody can delete it. So if you post stuff that's contrary views, to the centralized social media applications. Like for example, when some of my buddies were posting about like the COVID vaccine, deleted hundreds of thousands of followers down the drain. And so that's one thing. Another thing is that uh, ad revenue wouldn't really be there anymore. And so there would be tons of other things. Like for example, in, in some decentralized social media applications, like there's this one we're heavily investing in called DSO. And what it is, is people can invest into other people's creator coins. And so every single brand has their own like stock market where you can invest into other creators that you think are like going to perform well in the future. That's very interesting, man. It's it's like interesting to see where we're going. Um, and what you were just talking about with the ads, I was watching uh, the PBD podcast, Patrick Bet David. And I forget who he was interviewing, but he was interviewing somebody who said that <clears throat> they uh, on YouTube, they got rid of ads uh, that the, the YouTube demonetized them for something they said. Right. So they demonetized them. And they said, but what was interesting was the difference in views because they got demonetized. So their views also went way down, okay? And uh, it makes sense because YouTube's going to push content towards sponsored content, towards those ads, right? So now you're you're demonetized, so you don't have the ads, so they're not really even going to sh- send traffic your way. So it's just interesting, man. Um, but I, I thought that was a very interesting conversation on uh, the Patrick Bet David podcast. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, dude. Um 
I think censorship is real. I think that we've seen, we saw more censorship during like uh, the pandemic than we ever have uh, in, in history. And I think it's going to be a snowball that grows so big that it's not possible to come back. And we're seeing it more, for example, in Canada. Uh, there's been restrictions of Canadian news being shown on Instagram and Google because of stuff that's gone on during the government where that would never be a thing on decentralized social media because it can't be censored. And it only can be censored with centralized social media applications because it's owned by massive companies that their end goal is the profit margins and how much money they're making. Exactly. Exactly. It's all about the 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 dollar, the dollar bill. OK, um, these companies are greedy. Um Okay, so speaking of, we were talking about advertising and stuff like that. So what's the crucial difference for somebody who's a business owner to really understand between just social media content and direct advertising? And then how should they, you know, how should a business owner strike a balance between the two? Direct ads. So social media content is building your brand and your brand is there forever. Direct ads is not built in your brand necessarily. And the essence of, it's kind of like the difference between direct advertising and branding. And direct advertising, it's the essence of paying for something every single time it's shown in front of an audience. And that's what direct advertising is. You're paying for a piece of content to be shown for a select period of time, and then it disappears. That's why whenever you hear about direct ads, you're, you're talking about ROI. Like you need to be getting a return on investment every single time that you're running direct ads because then it disappears afterwards. But for example, social media content, when you're building your brand, you don't necessarily need to be getting a direct ROI from it because it's there forever and you're building that audience forever. And so you're retaining it forever, potentially. And so the healthy mix that I would say is always building up a social media profile first to a landing page level where you're happy with that, that social media account, maybe it's Instagram showcasing your credibility and authority and showcasing like the level of business that you do and exactly what you do. And the reason for that is because then when you start running Instagram ads or Facebook ads, those people are going to start clicking on your profile and be seeing who you are. And so if they click on your profile and there's no post up or it's a bad representation of the company that you have, then it's going to decrease your ROI and your, your CPA, your CPMs, like all of them through, throughout your direct ads. And so I always say, start with social media, get it up to a point of a landing page, then do direct ads and then grow them up proportionally. That makes so much sense. Yeah. You don't want to, you know, do these ads and get all these eyeballs on you and, and it's like you're not even set up right. You know, your profile's not set up right. You get all these eyeballs over there and everybody's clicking on you. And then when they get there, they're like, oh, this guy's a joker. I'm out of here. Peace. Right. So what a waste of money. You know what I'm saying? So, but if you're, if your profile's optimized first and you got a good, strong brand and like you were talking about, let's say you have the pinned posts up top that really showcase your credibility, maybe some testimonials or some uh, case studies or something like that. You've got some good content up top that um, draws them in and converts it right then those eyeballs land on the profile then they convert right so that's that's very smart so don't start that the direct advertising too soon y'all that's a great great point um, another question I have for you real quick uh, is you know we all know that social media is is powerful right but it can also have negative effects right and I think we've seen we've seen a lot of that uh, recently. Uh, what are some of the dangers or challenges that you've seen associated with social media and how could they be addressed? I think the biggest danger of social media is the user who uses social media and doesn't use it for anything productive. I personally think that social media is a tool and I was extremely gifted because my dad didn't allow me to have social media at a young age. He didn't allow me to have a phone. He basically said, work for your work for anything that you want, basically, like outside of the necessities, like a house, like food. But like if I wanted a bike, I would have to work to go get a bike. If I wanted a phone, I would have to work to go get a phone. So I ended up not having a phone until I was in grade 10. And then I didn't have social media until the end of grade 10. And I started up my business at the end of grade 10. And so 
the only thing I knew about social media was what my friends did and then how I used it as a tool based off of what people used it as. And that, that was a great gift is that I never saw social media as a consumption. I always saw it as distributing content as my a tool for the business, just a marketing method. And so I think the most dangerous component are the millions and millions, the hundreds of millions of people who use social media for nothing productive. They're consumers. And just just a distraction from life. They're consumers. So there's a difference between being a consumer and a creator, right? And so I love what you're saying because that's so smart, you know, uh, that you didn't have social media. So you're, you know, your, your pops was like, hey, you got to go out there and earn it. So, you know, you want a bike, you want something, you know, whatever it is that you want, you got to go earn it. My dad did the same thing for me, which was amazing. He taught me how to work hard and save and all that kind of stuff. A lot of values in that. Uh, instead, there's probably a lot of parents out there that are like, hey, here's here's your tablet. Here's your smartphone. And now what's happened is instead of instead of teaching your children to be creators, right, because that's what your father was teaching you to go out there and earn that bike. You had to create. Right. You had to do something to create to, to earn that bike. Right. Um, so he was teaching you how to be a creator. Instead, we're giving our kids tablets and, and phones at a very, very early age, super early age. And the excuse is, well, I want to be able to like, uh, you know, uh, keep in touch with them or whatever. Right. I want to be like, you know, I need to be, they got to be able to call me. Okay. Well, you don't need to give them a super computer in their pocket. Okay. Give them a flip phone or something. Anyways, what I'm saying is that we do this, we give the kids these things and we're, it's like turning them into creator or uh, uh, consumers, turning them into consumers because they get on the TikTok, they get on all these platforms and they're just consuming, 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 because it's addictive. We all know this. Social media is addictive. So you're giving like cocaine or crack to a, like a, a five-year-old kid, right? You're giving them the most addicting thing that we know. And like, you're sitting there going, oh, and we're just training. Well, what them. happens is, is, is the major social media platforms hire the same attention engineers. Yes, they, there's a, a job role called attention engineers. And it's the same ones that they hire from casinos. You can actually like look on, <laughs> they're basically company org. And there's literally people who came over from the casino industry to be attention engineers at social media applications for the sole basis of how to retain attention and keep people addicted for the longest period of time. It's insane. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. So guys, be careful with your kiddos. Okay. Uh, I did an episode with Elena Cardone uh, and we were talking about uh, a lot of the uh, child sex trafficking and all the stuff that goes on with the children. And, and it, guys, you know, it's not the the scary white bus that it used to be. Now it's right here. OK, the, the, a lot of the stuff that's happening with kids is the phones. It's the social media. It's the it, you know, it's scary. So you got to you got to watch with the kids, man, and the technology. You just have to watch it, man. And, and um, it's just a, such a powerful tool that I think the responsibility, you know what I mean? Like, think about that. I just want to talk about this real quick. Think about that. In order to drive a car, right? In order to drive a car, I gotta, you know, I gotta be a certain age, okay? I've gotta be able to uh, pass a test, right? You gotta go through and learn about the dangers of, you know, of driving and all these things, right? Like, but we give these powerful tools. It's this is just as dangerous. This is just as dangerous as a as an automotive, you know, vehicle, right? And we give that tool to a five-year-old and just let them run with no training, you know, no, you know, hey, and it's dangerous. These kids are getting extorted online. It's happening all the time. They get extorted. Um, just, just lots of crazy. We live in a crazy world, but uh, guys, be careful, be cautious with this stuff. Um, as we wrap up this episode, I do want to make sure that the audience knows where to connect with you because you're a freaking legend and i'm sure they can learn a lot from you what's the best way for them to connect with you and uh what's the best way for them to reach out for sure yeah thanks trevor i i really appreciate it. you asked some really thoughtful questions throughout all of it and yeah anybody listening if they want to connect um i just started posting way more content on my youtube channel and going to be posting weekly there so if you want to see more content me that's at Luke Lentz. And I think there's an underscore there on the YouTube. 
And then my Instagram is the best way to contact me. So at Luke Lentz on Instagram. Amazing, amazing. Guys, that's the show. Luke, we appreciate you being here today. You're a freaking legend, a rock star. I learned a lot and you're brilliant, man. I'm just excited to see like what the the uh 34 year old Luke look looks like. Golly, <laughs> 10 years from now, dude. It's crazy what, where you're gonna be, man. It's awesome. Just don't don't go buying no more Lambos, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> let's do another podcast where i'm at 34 bro let's do it holy smokes what a time capsule you know that's a cool thing too about podcasting and we didn't really get too too deep into podcasting but pop podcasting is a time capsule it's so cool i love it like from a documentary type of a thing like where you're at i mean i've been doing podcasting for uh six years now and i look back yeah i look back at like my first episode and it was awful <laughs> and and like how much better you get and just you know it's it's pretty cool guys i gotta tell you that um so anyways i i'm excited yeah we'll we'll definitely we're gonna catch up in 10 years bro we're gonna do another interview i want to see where you're at at 34 you're gonna be a, a billionaire by that time who knows man i'll have a private chat for sure yeah man hey let's do the podcast on the jet can we do that deal i'm gonna clip this i'm gonna clip it and send deal. it to you at 34 when you got your jet bro believe me i will <laughs> and i will send it to you and i'm gonna hold you accountable for that okay we're doing a podcast episode on the private jet let's go <laughs> let's go let's go let's go well guys i hope you enjoyed this episode thanks for tuning in that's the show it's all about who you know and a little bit of cash flow bye Thanks for listening to the Who You Know Show podcast. My name is Trevor Houston, and if you've enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing wherever you listen and leave us a positive review to help us keep the mics on in the studio. Until next week, that's the show. It's all about who you know. Who you know.